If I told you that one shift in daily habits could change the expression of nearly 20,000 protein coding genes and do it in a net positive for biological business manner, would you hear me out? Unless you just heard me and now you're just wondering how. I guess you have no choice but to see what all the hubba is about. Trust me, you're gonna go cuckoo for these longevity cocoa puffs. Yo, 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 what is up? Welcome back to another week of How to Health. My name is Kevin. I run liftandbalance.com where we take aim at all things health and longevity and do it in an odd, weird, interesting, and highly sarcastic manner. Today, we are combining three of our favorite topics and talking about how the very doable habit of consuming one's energy within a dedicated window each and every day may be one of the biggest bang for your buck health and longevity things that you can do. And we'll be doing this by exploring what might be the most extensive data to date, displaying the gene modulating effects of circadian aligned time restricted feeding across key organ systems and tissue types, hinting that it may be one of the secret underlying mechanisms driving the observed beneficial effects of the protocol. But we'll just have to see. And as you know, these three topics have been hallmarks of our longevity chasing powwows for some time now. So it's no surprise that we're finally getting more data shedding light on the links between them. So we'll start with a quick refresher on all three, structured meal timing, circadian alignment, and genetic expression then dive into this new data, exploring the connection. And finally, as always, finish up with some practical ways to deploy a strategy in real life. Cause this, this is real life, right? Just checking. So sit back and listen up because this next three minutes and 42 seconds will prime you for why this research we're about to review is so damn cool. And for your reference, we have full and elaborate breakdowns on all of these topics, the links of which I will put in the show notes below. With that, we embark, next stop being our DNA housing chromosomes, our genes and their expression. An often overlooked yet super important fact is that deep within all of our cells lies the entirety of our genome, meaning all of the different tissue types that make up our holistic self as we know it have the same exact genes. Cool, right? But also begging the question, what exactly makes them different? I mean, a neuron and a heart cell, although both important, certainly don't carry out the same function, right? Well. The simple answer here is it's the genes which are turned on and off, which make our cells different. This is known as epigenetic expression, a topic we touch on quite a bit across this channel. But as it pertains for this conversation, here's what you gotta know. We have upwards of 20,000 protein coding genes, meaning when these genes are expressed or presented the right biological trigger, they code for the creation of proteins, which often have a whole body systemic effect. And guess what? This process is what essentially allows us to carry out life as we know it. So it's kind of important. And when it comes to our cells, each cell type has a number of these genes that are always turned on or off, while also having a number of genes which fluctuate based on the context of the situation. Huh, but what causes it? To fluctuate, Kev? Great question. In simple terms, our environment, aka the context in which we're living life. Our diet, movement, sleep, stress, nature exposure, circadian alignment, and likely a ton of factors we haven't even scratched the surface of thinking about yet. And based on those everyday factors, many of those fluctuating genes across our various tissue types become expressed in different ways, ultimately determining how well we operate at the cellular and metabolic level. And thus, by association, determining our short-term health and long-term longevity. With that, we end our crash course in epigenetics and turn to two of the most powerful environmental modulators of this genetic expression, eating and circadian clock alignment. I mean, come on, isn't this fun? I see you having fun over there. 
as we've discussed in many prior videos. More and more evidence continues to support the notion that meal timing has power, displaying that strategically aligning our eating into consistent daily windows may be a simple and powerful way to get our health back in line and our clocks back in sync. What clocks, you ask? Well, the most important one you own, the one that has potential to go full on cuckoo, your body clock, or your evolutionary wired biological rhythm, also known as circadian rhythm, which ebbs and flows in accordance to the light and darkness cycles of that big flaming supernova we call the sun. Now here's where things start to come together, I think. Not only does waking up as the sun rises and heading to bed when it sets, relatively speaking, regulate the genetic expression throughout our body in a health-promoting way, which, might I add, we talk all about in this video here, but it just so happens that when and how much we eat entrains the clock and genetic expression of many of the periphery organs throughout the body, often modulating them during periods of consumption and periods of fasting. Now, here's the thing. As we've discussed prior, Modern research indicates that staying up eating into the wee hours of the night can throw our internal body clock out of whack, cuckoo, if you will, causing a downstream flurry of suboptimal effects, which ultimately increase the odds, likelihood, and probability of disease over time. Not cool, I know. However, these are effects that consistent meal timing seems to help alleviate. Here's how by breaking one's energy consumption into predefined daily windows, ideally 10 hours or less during normal waking hours, one entrains their body to know and prepare for food at a certain time each and every day. And in doing so likely optimizes its metabolic function while also its restorative, regenerating, detoxifying pathways during sleep. It's essentially like using your features when they're best optimized to be used. Not a bad deal, right? A deal which has been repeatedly observed in both animal and human models, displaying how consuming all of our caloric energy in predefined windows each day without changing anything else like caloric intake can have powerful impacts on an organism's health. We're talking glucose stabilizing, insulin sensitizing, sirtuin activating, autophagy stimulating, stem cell reawakening, inflammation lowering, fat adapting effects, effects that forward thinkers in the field believe daytime eating may optimize, arguing that this type of eating aligns with the way we've evolved to eat, better equipped to digest and metabolize food during the day, and reaping a higher quality, more restorative sleep as a byproduct. Pretty interesting, right? This, along with a very positive end of one experience, has made me a dinner rebel for nearly five years now a journey and experience which I break down in full detail here. Now, with that primer and 42 seconds to spare, let's dive into this new data displaying meal timing's genetic expression regulating effect in action. The study. Researchers out of the Salk Institute sought to see how time-restricted eating affects an organism at the molecular level across a variety of different tissue types, and if that could be one of the underlying reasons for its positive health effects. To do this, they turned to a mouse model simply because deep analysis like this is just not capable of being done in humans without breaking every single, and I mean every single, ethical code in the book. So here's what they did. Researchers fed two groups of genetically identical mice the same high calorie diet. One group was given free access to the food whenever they wanted, while the other was restricted to eating within a nine hour feeding window each day. And after seven weeks, tissue samples were collected from 22 organ groups every two hours and analyzed for genetic changes. Samples included tissue from the liver, stomach, lungs, heart, adrenal gland, hypothalamus, different parts of the kidney and intestines, and several areas of the brain. Basically, every single vital system was invited to this party. Now, an important point that I want to reiterate here was that these two groups ate the same high-calorie diet. 
Western lifestyle emulating diet. The only difference being when they had availability to it. This controls the potential influencing effects of calorie restriction and healthy eating on the outcomes. So with that, what happened? Well, the best way I can describe it is the genomic equivalence of an interpretive dance. You know, the one we all do uncontrollably every time Taylor Swift releases a new single. No? We're gonna cut that. Moving on. First, researchers detected over 21,000 transcription changes across all the various tissue types, with nearly 19,000 of those transcription factors being protein-coding genes. Again, meaning genes, when turned on, code for proteins which essentially modulate our entire biological function. Wild. I know. Now, of these genetic changes, around 70% were expressed across all tissue at the same time, meaning something was coordinating them all together. Here's where it gets super cool. They found that time-restricted feeding affected the expression and rhythmicity of most genes, but did it in a tissue-specific manner, meaning the specific genes that were upregulated or silenced were specific to that particular organ or tissue. For example, the same exact gene could be upregulated in the liver due to time-restricted feeding, but silenced or not affected at all in the heart or brain. Ultimately, they found that time-restricted feeding increased this rhythmicity of gene expression across multiple tissues and consolidated this gene expression into two distinct phases associated with feeding and fasting states, being involved in optimizing metabolism and function along the way. Pretty cool and totally not cuckoo. That's a good thing, remember. Interestingly, the top pathways upregulated by time-restricted feeding was fatty acid catabolism, protein folding in the endoplasmic reticulum, RNA processing, lysosome function, and ribosomal biogenesis, all key and vital functions for cellular health. While the top pathways suppressed by time-restricted feeding were the oxidative stress response, activation of immune response, death receptor signaling, glycerolipid metabolism, and branched-chain amino acid degradation, all things we tend to want toned down and not overactive if necessary. Adding to all this, something that I personally found super interesting was that researchers observed time-restricted feeding induced branched-chain amino acid catabolism genes in white adipose tissue, but down-regulated them in the liver, muscle, heart, brown adipose tissue and kidneys, showing just how tissue-specific this response could be. I mean, at this point, we shouldn't expect anything less from our pretty cool meat survival machine, but whoa. All in all, the lead author, Sachin Panda, who is a pioneer in circadian alignment and fasting research, had this to say. Circadian rhythms are everywhere in every cell. We found that there is a system-wide molecular impact of time-restricted eating in mice. And by changing the timing of food, we were able to change the gene expression, not just in the gut or in the liver, but also in thousands of genes in the brain. Our results opened the door for looking more closely at how this nutritional intervention activates genes involved in specific diseases, such as cancer. So the only question left is, what exactly does this mean? And what can you do in your everyday life? Well. In my eyes, this is just another piece in the ever-growing puzzle, which maps out how we humans are at our biological best when we live in accordance to the very way that biology evolved. We weren't staying up all night binging on a 24-7 supply of mouth-watering, energy-dense, nutrient-scarce, ultra-processed crap. Instead, we were in alignment with the day-night cycles of the sun. We likely consumed the majority of our energy during the daylight hours and had a solid 12 hours of nightly fasting until the next day. Research like this just helps explain why meal timing and structure matter. Keeping in mind, of course, that due to its limitations of being an animal model, this is only a glimpse into the potential effects in us humans. And no one study human or animal should be the source of truth when it comes to fasting, or for that matter, anything. It takes an abundance of good, solid evidence to display efficacy and effectiveness. And with time-restricted feeding, 
it continues to build. But more, especially in humans, is always needed. So when looking into a place to start with a health intervention, it's no surprise why I like structured timing to eating as a pretty effective and relatively simple first step. Because as we discussed before, it doesn't entail any crazy dietary reform and total lifestyle upheaval. Instead, just focuses on adding structure, a foundation to build on over time. For we know, the secret sauce to vitality and longevity is being intentional and methodical with the approach of sustainably adding habits over time. And the fact that simply incorporating some structure into your daily eating can keep your body operating more efficiently at the cellular and metabolic level makes it a no-brainer, if you ask me. A simple and doable onboarding to healthier eating that has a lot of cellular upside and very little downside. But what do I know? I'm just some crazy dude on the tube of you. So always discuss with your medical professional before embarking on anything. With that, when it comes to building your ideal protocol, here's an approach to noodle on. First, baseline yourself. Spend a week observing what your normal feeding window looks like, including when you start consuming any liquids or solids with caloric containing content. And yes, milk and sugar in the morning beverage counts. And when you finish, research indicates that most people drastically underestimate how large their feeding window actually is. So observe yourself. And while doing that, identify a goal window that you eventually want to achieve. Ideally, 10 hours or less, closing it out around two hours before bed. And with this information, slowly adjust your current window by about 20 to 30 minutes every few weeks, shaving off a few minutes on each end until you reach your desired window. This will allow your body to adjust with minimum friction, making the transition much more sustainable. Remember, we're all playing the long game here, so take your time and know that part of making it sustainable is being flexible when you need to, because consistency is always more important than perfection. Oh, and it's also important to remember that no habit is a silver bullet. True long-term health and longevity comes from an overall shift in lifestyle habits, a shift which encompasses real whole food eating habits, high quality sleep, circadian alignment, daily movement, stress management, and nature. But as we know, Rome wasn't built overnight, and neither is cellular and metabolic efficiency. But as we learned today, one of the best first steps is swapping out that old dysfunctional cuckoo clock. So don't leave it to chance. <laughs> <laughs>